on the West Coast or somewhere in between. Uh, thanks for being here for today's webinar, 10 Decisions You Will Face with Any Donor Data Migration Project. And my name is Stephen Shattuck, and I'm the VP of Marketing here at Bloomerang, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. And before we begin, I just want to let everyone know that we are recording this presentation, and I'll be sending out the recording later on this afternoon. So if you have to leave early or if you want to review the content with some members of your team a little later on, uh, just know that I will be sending out that recording uh, a little later today, as well as the slides, so you'll be receiving those. And uh, we're doing something a little new on our Bloomerang webinar today. We've got a poll up on the screen. Uh, so if you have not already uh, answered that poll, please do. Just take a couple of minutes and answer those three questions. Uh, and when you do that, you should see a little confirmation screen. Um, and we'll be sharing the answers uh, and the data of that poll a little later on uh, this afternoon. So uh, while you're doing that poll, I want to go ahead and introduce uh, my guest today. He is Gary Carr. Hey, Gary, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Good. And for those of you who don't know Gary, Gary is the founder and president of Third Sector Labs. And he's got 20 years of ex more than 20 years of experience, actually, uh, delivering software and data solutions to a wide variety of clients. Um, Gary is really focused on data. He's going to be talking about data today. And that's what uh, Thir Third Sector Labs does. Uh, they're committed to making sense out of data for the nonprofit industry. So Gary, really good to have you here. Uh, what's going to happen is Gary's going to run through his presentation today, and we're going to sa save a little bit of time at the end for questions. So as you're listening to Gary, uh, please feel free to send any questions our way via the chat box uh, there on your webinar screen. We'll both see those, and uh, we'll try to answer just as many as possible during the uh, formal Q&A session. And uh, if we can't get to all the questions, uh, Gary has agreed to, to ask, answer some of them uh, online uh, a little later on after the presentation. So don't be shy. Uh, Gary is a data expert. He is here for you. Um, so Gary, I think we could probably close the poll. What do you think? You got enough answers? We've got a lot of good answers on the poll. I'm going to close it. Cool. And I'm going to see if we can share the results here. Um, yeah, I can see them. Great. Great. So uh, ver I'm sorry? Pretty interesting uh, results there. <laughs> Um, and uh, it, across a number of our webinars, I know this is not scientific for the folks that are with us today, uh, but it does give us some good insight into a number of different system technology and data related issues uh, when we participate in the webinar um, or we're hosting a webinar. And so we tend to ask the same questions uh, over and again. It's interesting here, we'll talk about these results a little bit as we go through the presentation, but uh, for the folks that are, are with us today, um, the results that I'm seeing here are pretty consistent with results that we have seen across other events from other respondents. Uh, I do want to say that it's, uh, on the second question, the number of technology systems that people are using to execute their campaigns this is the highest response rate we've ever had for just one or two systems. The majority of respondents that we've seen in the past have been dealing with three to five and even six or more systems. So for the folks that are with us today, congratulations. You are finding ways to make things easier with technology, not necessarily more difficult. I think that's a good thing. So I'm going to um, stop sharing the results, Steve, and take us, hopefully I'm going to take us over to the presentation. Hey, Great. So thanks again, everyone, um, for being with us today. Thanks to Bloomerang for hosting this event. Uh, Ten decisions. Uh, well, we've, we've covered the poll, but we, we're going to have a, a short agenda here. After we get through the general overview, we've got some ground rules that we want to talk about related to data, data systems, data migration. And then we're going to take a look at the process and the planning that you do around a data migration for uh, focus on the context of donor data migration. And then we'll jump to the 10 unavoidable decisions and then look at the takeaways in the Q&A at the end. I appreciate your, uh, uh, your overview and, and giving my background. Uh, third Sector Labs, we, we provide a variety of data-related services. And if you visit our website, you can find more detail on them. But basically, we're doing level one type work for just cleanings and assessments, then we'll take our client work to a second level of, of complexity or a second level of involvement around data management, migration, 
like we're talking about today, enrichment. And then we'll also handle some very sophisticated, we call them level three uh, services, level three problem solving. We'll do some fairly sophisticated work around data warehousing, mining, system integration. So when we, when we wrote the, the topic for the webinar today, for the event, there are actually some loaded words in here. Um, can decisions, no, not making a decision is still a decision, and we're going to talk about that. You will face these. They are, we think these are pretty much unavoidable in any donor data or CRM uh, data migration. Donor data is an interesting concept. It is far more degradable if you haven't thought about that or you haven't encountered that uh, in your day-to-day -day work. It is far more degradable than many other types of data that you may deal with, for example, outcome measurement data. Um, donor data is degradable as our lives are. And something we want everybody thinking about when you think about the word migration, migration involves movement, movement involves risk. So a loaded topic today. Data confounds us. Why does data confound us? Why does it give us uh, reason to pause, reason to um, feel perplexed, or sometimes even get confusing? Well, traditionally, we thought about data and science. You know, we thought about it like the Sherlock Holmes quote. You know, it's a capital mistake to theorize before you have data. That's sort of a very traditional approach. You know, you need some data, you need some facts, then you make your decisions. And then along came the information age. And we got the second quote that's been attributed to more people than I can keep track of. Uh, data is the new oil. Okay, that's interesting. That, that means data is driving our information age. Okay, that makes sense to me. And then we started, we, meaning the data geeks of the world like me, we started one-upping each other, and we came up with clever quotes like, well, data is just the new oil, but it's a whole new kind of resource. And I, I sort of associate quotes like that with tech guys like me trying to take over um, industries in the world and, and claim that we've got some sort of secret soft knowledge that nobody else has, so you better listen to us. I think a little bit of an overstatement. I think data is like a new oil. It is driving the information age. Um, let's make sure we figure out how to keep data in its place, and that takes us to the heart of the problem. I found this great quote from Josh Whedon. Josh is a screenwriter, director, some of you may follow his work. But he, he, he put up this, this uh, conundrum one time. In a, uh, when he was, I can't even remember why he was being interviewed. But he talked about the fact that he is personally frustrated with the fact that we have institutions like the uh, NSA collecting gobs of data, collecting mega amounts of data on us individually, and how it, it, it's disturbing. It makes us feel uncomfortable. There's so much data out there. As he played, it freaks them out. And yet, we are the generation that wants to put a GPS on our kids so we always know where they are. Well, that's, that's data. So how do we deal with this, this conundrum? How do we deal with this, this sort of conflict in how we approach technology and data? And I think it, we sort of sum it up because we're feeling overwhelmed. That's the challenge for so many clients that we talk to and, and, and partners that we work with in the industry. Everybody feels overwhelmed. Big data is big confusion. Um, it's not just what data do we need, but even more challenging is sometimes the question of what's the data that we can ignore. And that sort of gets at the heart of today's presentation, right? What, what donor data do we need and what data can we ignore? So that's the theme running in the, in the background behind our discussion today. So if you're here with us, uh, you're here. Wow, one, 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 one. We're going to call all these equal then. Um, you're here because you're in the midst of a CRM migration, or perhaps you've got one coming up and you want to plan for it. You may have and have some problems or some issues you're still wrestling with, but probably got a CRM data migration that, that is right around the corner or has just left you around the corner, and you're trying to, to wrestle with that a little bit. Um, I doubt many of you are so inspired by data that you're here looking for a job for, with third sector, but, you know, there could be a few. Um, but so what are the ground rules that we talked about? The ground rules, the, the, the points that we're going to reference throughout this presentation that really are not part of, they're not negotiable, it's just sort of recognizing that this is the way it is in the industry. Uh, this is the way it is with data. 
Um, thanks for that comment, Mark Fort. You love uh, never tear down a grave before you know why it was built. It may be your only means of retreat. It's a very wise statement that I picked up somewhere. Um, it's definitely some uh, a, a ground rule, if you will, that good smart technologists live by. We don't want to replace things. We don't want to tear things down. We don't want to get rid of the old until we have a good reason for it and we know what we're going to be doing as we look forward. So the ground rule for us today, the ground rule for a discussion around donor data migration, first and foremost, all of your donor relationships depend upon data. All of them do. So your data needs to be as complete as possible. What does complete mean? Number two, complete is what you're going to use. Think about that. Think about that as we talk through our questions today. What does that really mean? What do you really need? How much data do you need? How what does it need to look like? What are you going to use? And then the flip side of that is always, what are you not using? If you're not using it, why is it still around? Your shiny new CRM, your new uh, donor database, that's your future, not your past. It's a very important concept that we run into a lot of challenges with clients that, that don't recognize that. We are talking about your future, the success of your future. We are not talking about your past. Reports are your past. CRM is your future. Not making a decision, number four, is still a decision. I cannot stress that enough. Uh, when we talk about these 10 decisions that we're going to go through today, you've got to act on them. Uh, if you just push them off, and the reality is you've made a decision, and it's going to be to your detriment. Lastly, all donor migrations, all data migrations, Start with an understanding of the process. They require um, a plan. And that's where we're going to get started with our next slide. What's the process and the plan that we're talking about? So it's moving time, right? I've got a, a bunch of logos here representing different donor management systems, different CRMs. I'm sure that, that we've all run into many of these, if not most or all of them, from simple access and Excel spreadsheet to very large, we can do it all systems to newer systems that have come onto the market that, uh, that address some very specific and important aspects of fundraising and donor management. So there are, there are pros and cons. We're moving from something to something. So it's moving time. What's the technical process? Well, I, I chuckled with somebody one time talking about this because their view of, of what we do in a data migration is that we take all of that stuff from the old system and we shove it into the new system. And that's kind of what it's like, right? That's all you got to do. Uh, and we're shoving it into a cloud because so many of the new systems are, are software as a service. They're cloud-based, access anywhere. Um, so just get all those zeros and ones out of the old, cram it into the new, and we're good to go, right? All we got to do. Not exactly. Um, the technical process really looks more like this. Uh, six steps that we have to get through. Those six steps are pretty standard for any data migration. You're going to do analysis up front. There are mappings across systems. There's a data extraction that's going to occur from the legacy system. Configuration of the new database that you're moving it into. Create your import files and run your import. Right? It's a six-step process. That's it. Well, not exactly. There's really a lot more going on. There are a lot of additional steps that are going to occur that you may or may not be aware of as your, your consultant or your expert or your vendor representative is taking you through the data migration process. There are some really that need to be scheduled around things like data cleaning, parsing uh, data. There are multiple rounds of testing that are going to be run. So you're going to run, uh, or your, your consultant, you're going to need to run test files, rerun test files. You're going to be reconfiguring your database. Um, when you get there fully ready to import, step number six, you'll notice how many additional boxes there are around number six, because you're going to test, you're going to retest, you're going to re-import, you're going to clean, you may well re-import again after that. And when you get done, at the end of the process, then you're going to start thinking about what your archives need to look like. What happened to all the data you couldn't move over? 
And so a six-step process really starts to look like about a 14 or 15-step process and could get longer than that depending upon the number of steps that you have to repeat. And I, I bring this up because this is what I want you to be prepared for as you're, as you're thinking about an engagement or you're, you're addressing or planning that next donor data migration. Um, what are you going to encounter? And how simple does the, does the work seem versus how much work really needs to get done? Creating a plan is really something that your, your expert, your consultant, or your vendor representative should be doing. But I bring this up because you guys, uh, with the responsibilities that you have for your own organizations, you can take steps to be better prepared. The, um, the checklist that I pulled on our website, um, any plan starts with a good checklist. You've got data migration uh, steps that you need to think about in the planning process. Uh, and then you've got steps that also, on the right-hand side, and this, this image is a little grainy, and I apologize for that, um, but you also have steps that are going to be occurring during the process. The steps may or may not occur in the same order every time you run through a plan, every time your expert is taking you through the plan or doing the work, but the steps are all going to be there, perhaps moved around a little bit. The important point here is that you've got this You've got, a, um, you've got something available to you so that you're not at the mercy of Clint or at the mercy of being the base expert that's doing the move for you. You feel like you have a little bit of power, uh, a little bit more knowledge, and better preparation as you start going through the process. So we, we've talked about the ground rules. We've talked about the important understanding the process, understanding the plan, and what are those unavoidable decisions that we're going to run into. Let's start with the biggie. Do we need a data governance policy? And by the way, what in the world is data governance? Um, I, again, I'm a little self-serving here. I hope that's okay. I'm pulling a, uh, a page off of our website. We have a donor data management dictionary with a bunch of terms that you may or may not be familiar with or, or you may wonder what, are, what does that really mean. So data governance is simply having a set of rules or policies that are going to um, tell you how are you going to manage and maintain data quality with the assets in your organization. So you're talking about um, standards that are going to impact compliance with third party, uh, with third party standards. Do you have regulatory issues that you need to deal with? What about backup and security? Um, frequency of updates, numbers, numbers of certain data fields that you want to keep, uh, versions of data fields, historical versioning of your data. There's a whole series of, of data policies or standards that can be thought of as data governance. There's no one right answer for everybody. These policies are going to vary from organization to organization. What's important is that you know that you need them. So the answer to the question is, do you really need data to, to, to have data governance policies or standards in place before you start that data migration? The answer is yes. And the reason for that is because without them, without that fond set of rules or standards, doing the work is going to have so many questions that you can't answer that you're just going to continue to interrupt the process, interrupt the data migration, and have to return again and again to um, get those questions answered. And so you're going to be revisiting data governance. Your, your, your governance policies or your standards should generally cover these, these areas of um, specialization. What's the purpose? Um, what defines a complete record? What are the processes? So then you're going to have to run processes, such as how do you, why do you gather, how do you input your data, how frequently do you clean it, um, you're going to have storage policies. You're going to have um, uh, that, that second point under the storage is really important at some point. When does a prospect stop being a prospect and just become bad data? Uh, but you're also going to have storage policies around things like how many instances of addresses or email, uh, email addresses do you keep? How many versions of records 
Um, and then security, what are your security policies? Depending upon the organization, you may have uh, third-party compliance issues, you may have system integration issues that you need to address in your, in your data governance. But again, you want to have a you want to have this decision made, these standards in place, before you start your data migration. It doesn't mean there won't be exceptions to the rule. There will be. But let's make sure we've got some rules. So number two, how many years of donor data do we actually migrate? This is a great question. Uh, I have received, heard this question so many times. I've been on a, a number of other um, webinars related to CRMs and donor migration, and this question inevitably comes up. How many years of donor data do you really need? Well, the wrong answer here um, is that you need to bring it all. That's the data hoarder in all of us. We just can't let go of something. We think we might need it. Um, we're afraid to let go of something that might be really important. The correct answer Ask yourself, when was the last time you actually logged into your CRM and studied donors or their gifts or, or any other related data that was more than three years old? Because the odds are that doesn't happen very often. Um, you may look at trend reports. You may look at historical reports. But you're not actually uh, As I mentioned before, a donor is degradable. People's lives change. And so, the rule of thumb that we share with our clients is start with three years. Three years is a, is a good amount of data migrate out of your old system and put into your new system. Beyond that, justify any data, older data. Justify it with specific use cases. Not just because you're afraid of losing the data, but just um, so, so you, you're sort of putting the burden on yourself to, to defend why you would want to bring in that fourth or fifth year of data. What are you going to do with it? How is it going to help you? Um, how is it going to make your organization better or make your fundraising more successful? So start with three, work it, or justify anything else. That's two down, eight to go. Big question number three. What do we do about our last data? Uh, I'm sorry, our last donors. Do we import them too? Last donors are, are treated a little differently, organization, but generally it's someone who has not, who used to give to you, but has not given in the past two or three years. Um, most organizations that we've worked with, if someone just hasn't given in one year, they've kind of lost them out of the cycle. They don't really treat them as a loss or a last, a, a last donor, someone that's been lost and has to come back. Uh, but once you get a couple of years, um, out, you've got old data. And so here's what I want to tell you. Here's what I want to share with everybody. Those lapsed donors are not a data problem. It's a communication problem. It's a fundraising problem. And I think it's really important to understand the difference. We're not trying to solve a data problem here. So the correct answer is it depends. What do you do with your lapsed donors? Option A is that you segment your lapsed donors upon import. You identify them uh, with a code. You identify them as lapsed, and the purpose would be if you're using a new system, I'm going to put a plug in here for Bloomerang because uh, I really do like how Bloomerang addresses donor retention and is going to help uh, an organization get at the lapsed donor problem. Um, if you've got a new system and you're, you've purchased that system because you want to take advantage of those retention-based tools, then by all means, you're going to want to segment and bring those lapsed donors into your new system. You need a strategy. You're going to need to send uh, two to three, four communications, schedule it over a period of, of a number of months. You're coming up with new messaging to target those donors, right? Because whatever you've been doing before hasn't worked. So you've got this group. You've got, you know, in a database of 30,000 donors, you've got 10,000 that are lapsed. You're going to make sure that you can segment them, go after them with new messaging, and anyone that's responding is going to stay in that CRM. But you're going to purge the people who don't respond. They're lapsed. They're lost. Um, the other option would be you don't import your lapsed code. So you, you set, again, this kind of gets back to your, your data governance too, right? You set your standards. 
Um, you're not going to bring over people who have not given to you in the last three years. How, but you may be able to identify those last donors in your old system, and maybe you can use that old system to manage that targeted outreach. And if that's the case, before you're bringing them in, um, you're going to use that old system to run that same targeted that I talked about just a moment ago. The advantage here is that you're not looking at a bunch of old data, it's a bunch of bad data, which then you will have to purge once you go through that campaign. So um, depends upon the tools you've got, depends upon the reason you've selected your new CRM, depends upon um, how aggressively you're going to go after those last donors in some sort of mini campaign to identify them and get them re-engaged. But what we're trying to avoid here is bringing over a bunch of old lost data that won't do you any good going forward. Number four. What about that data that we can't or we don't import? Because there's going to be we can't or don't import. Well, the wrong answer is keep trying. And, and we have gotten this message more than once from a client that you're, we're working with. Uh, we got to get it all in there. It's got to fit. It's fit, it's fit in our old system. Um, it's not necessarily fitting in the new one. Why not? We need all of data. And that's the wrong approach. And I think you guys have figured that out because I've been repeating myself on this point um, throughout the system. We're talking about the future, not the past. Archives are for the past. There are simple technologies that you can use to archive data that is not brought over to your new system. So for example, let's say you're leaving uh, Razor's Edge and you're coming into um, uh, Neon or, or you know, a Bloomerang or City CRM. You're coming from an old, you're going into the new. You don't necessarily need to retain your old archive data within your old system. That can also be problematic. Nobody wants to go back and fire up Razor's Edge a year later because there was some data that they didn't think they needed, but then it turns out they did. Um, you don't want to have to go to an old, you know, an old computer, fire up an old system, and then try to find out what you need. Instead, what you're going to do is at the end of your data migration process, whatever data did not come across, you're going to have that data put into an archive format that you could easily access in the future should you need it. Um, it's a great peace of mind. You can go back to it. Odds are you won't, or maybe within you, you will within three months or so, uh, but not long after that. And hopefully the decisions around archiving in terms of you know, what data is not coming across, hopefully. That's being driven by those data governance policies as well. Number five. This is a great question. We see this a lot. Um, that's ad hoc text fields. Those ad hoc text fields are storing a lot of notes, a lot of data. What do you do about them? Why do you have them? Right? Older CRM systems, older databases, had far fewer data fields in them. The systems had less flexibility. And so um, in, the, in the little table on this slide, you know, this is an exaggeration, I know. Um, I've got a four-field database, and I've got a whole bunch of data slammed into the notes field. This little four field example is the exaggeration, but all of the data that you're seeing in those notes, we've seen that times 10 in note fields. It's be, what do we do about them? So we've, we've got these ad hoc text fields. We know they were needed in the old system. In the new system, hopefully you don't need it. You're not going to need a lot of these, these um, ad hoc text fields. Hopefully your new system is, you're, you're, one of the reasons you're choosing that new system is because of the, the breadth of data fields that you have available to you, um, and the flexibility with creating a new data field that you might need that you hadn't thought about yesterday. You're going to save those that text data. You're going to save it, and you're going to parse it later. Now, not now. Why do I say that? 
parsing project is, is, the, is the process of taking one data field and splitting it up into two, three, four, five different data fields. It very often requires some data analysis. Uh, it requires its own round of testing. And it's something that you will want to do after your data migration, uh, typically. You, the reason for that is it's its own project. Data parsing is its own project. You may very well have a, for example, a quote from a consultant or a vendor to manage your data migration in 40 hours, 80 hours, 120 hours, whatever that is, you know, whatever the quote is. Um, and that quote all may be based on a somebody completely missing the fact that you've got these, part, these fields that are going to need to be parsed, and the work on those parsing those fields can take up half as much of the time it takes for the full data migration. It's not necessarily easy work. So what we're doing is we're going in um, as the data guys, and we are looking at those fields that need to be parsed. We're interpreting the data that is in those fields. We're going to export it into some additional tool. Yeah. Sometimes we'll know. Excel actually has parsing capabilities in it, if you didn't know that. Um, it, it, it's a very good tool for some very simple parsing exercises. But basically, we're going to have to get that information, data, get it into the tool, run through the parsing, and then we're going to have to do our, another mapping. We're going to have to take that data that you see in one field, map it to three, four, five, or six new fields, and then there's a whole import process and testing process that goes around that. So that's why I say, you know, that parsing exercise, set it aside, you can get, you, you do that work after you get through your full data migration. So your result of the parse, if you, in our four field database example, now we've got like 10 different fields, we broke everything apart. Um, and this gets at one of the ground rules I talked about earlier, if you remember. Complete is what you will use. So we're looking at this data, you see all this stuff stuck into the next field, it looks like we're going to use everything in my example. So a complete record now looks like this new database. A complete is based on what we are using. We know we will use all of this information. Okay, five down, five to go. Number six, when do we clean our data? Do we do it before the data migration? Do we do it after the data migration? Great question. Um, when was the last time sorry, this is a lot. when was the last time that you cleaned your donor data? Uh, this was one of our questions in the poll um, the, in a poll that many times. We didn't run it earlier in the poll today. But basically, most folks don't know when it was cleaned. Uh, about 30 will tell us that they've, the data has been cleaned within the last three months. And then the rest of it is just a, a guess. It's, it's long term. And so the answer about when you actually want to go in and clean is really going to be it depends. The rule of thumb is you're going to you're going to clean your data before you actually um, migrate into the new system. You want to bring only the data across that you're going to use, you want to bring it across in the cleanest and easiest to manage format. You don't want to bring problems over, you want to bring good data over. So what that means, if you look at the right-hand side of this slide, what that means is we've applied our, our data governance, we've done our normalization, we've, we've deduced the data, we've purged a bunch of records, and then after the import, some of the data management tasks that we may have might be appending the data, to enrich it and, and add fields. Um, after the import, it might be to parse, but the rule of thumb is we want to get the cleaning done up front. However, there are going to be exceptions. I'll give you an example. Uh, we worked with a client where the, the database, CRM database, I think it was a Razor's Edge database, commingled records across multiple organizations that all had a parent organization sitting up above them. Um, the challenge we had, was uncertainty around record ownership. So there were records that were shared. There were records where we were going to have to do additional work to figure out who owns what. And so working with the client, we didn't make this decision on our own, but working with the client, 
we had to make the, we made the decision we were going to bring all of the data across. Um, once we got the new database, we were going to use some of the database tools to then help us clean that data, remove um, the customer had a little bit of a sense of urgency where they needed to get out of the old system and get into the new. So they were going to have a resource dedicated to um, uh, purging the records that they determined were in, in the database anymore. So we, we established some guidelines. We got the data moved. The data that came across, we did not move anything that was corrupted. Um, we did do deduplication. De but we brought a larger mass of data across knowing that there was cleaning and purging that still needed to occur um, after that, that engagement was completed. We did it with the customer's knowledge and planning, so everybody was prepared to handle it that way. That's a little bit of an exception, but it happened. So you know, part of the planning process is really making sure that everybody understands what has to be accomplished. Now this, one, this question comes up a lot. Um, it, it often generates a sense of real stress in a data migration project. You are two, three, four months into your migration project and you just figure out that there's data that won't translate into the new CRM. You thought it would. You expected that fields X, Y, and Z were all going to come across and populate correctly and it's not happening. It's not working. Have you made the wrong CRM choice? Uh, is your data far worse than anybody thought it was? I mean, what do you do now? Well, we might feel the sense of panic because we've spent so much time and effort on this engagement getting us to this point, but we don't want you to panic. This is not uncommon. This occurs um, more often than you would think. And it typically is going to occur after we get through uh, not only the analysis and the mapping that we've created, but we've actually configured that CRM and we've started to run files. We've started to run test files to bring data over how that data is populating in the new system. So, for example, we might be looking at a donor record on the right-hand side and we start to see that, that the individual who's represented there, um, we're doing our testing and we can see that only half of his gifts have come across. Or, uh, we're missing employment information or, I don't know, I'm picking stuff out, but we're, we're definitely missing information that we know should be there. So the new CRM either is not accepting or not interpreting correctly the data that's coming as well. So what do you do? You stop what you're doing. You stop the imports. You've got to go back and you've got to start identifying your gaps and the mistakes that are being made. So a project timeline may very well get interrupted at this point. You know, you, you may be in the or third month of a process that was supposed to only take three or four months, and now you're going to have to probably take a couple of weeks and work through this process. It's going to require a remapping. That's going to be tedious. Nobody's going to want to do that. Um, you're going to have to go back and, and investigate your new CRM. Odds are it's the right CRM. You don't want to change your decision about the CRM. You just need to go look at the database and see what kind of fields are missing, are not configured correctly, are not accepting or interpreting data correctly. All fixable, but this is going to take a little bit of time. Then you're going to create new test files. You're going to rerun your test files. Uh, hopefully you get through your problem in one or two iterations, and then you can begin your import process again. But you've got to be open-minded into this problem. Um, and you want your consultant to be asking you, why is this problem occurring? This old data that we're having trouble, uh, we, thought it would, we thought it would fit, we thought it would work, uh, we thought the new system was going to interpret it correctly, but it's not. What's the real problem here? Is it that we do need to work on the CRM a little more and we need to remap? Or do we have, um, are we trying to accommodate old data? Do we really have data in here that really shouldn't be in the system and we've been trying to jam it in with an accommodation because the customer kept saying they really had it, they really needed it, 
And so we tried and we tried, but it's just not working. Um, the CRM represents your future, right? That's your ground rule. So be honest and open-minded when you run into this problem. Ask yourself why this might be happening. It, it, it does occur, not the end of the world. It doesn't mean that you've made a wrong CRM decision, but you need to work the problem, and when you're working the problem, you just need to be open with yourself. So number eight, um, this kind of gets back to uh, an earlier question, but it does come up enough that I thought well, I would break it apart and talk about it on its own. We can't agree, right? We, we have been trying to work through this process early in the, um, early in the process. We can't agree on what data we should keep. We can't agree on what data we should be purging. The communications team says this. The fundraising team says this. Uh, the major gift people say this. Uh, can we just bring it over? all of it and then decide later? And the answer is no. Not making a decision is making a decision. And to just put off that issue may very well create more problems than you realize when you're going through the migration process. So if you're stuck on some standard, you're stuck on some data governance policy, or you have two different parts of the organization that are wrestling over with, wrestling over what data needs to come across, you need to stop and work through that problem. Um, it's important. You always can have an archive. The archive is always your peace of mind. So that's, that's an important reminder. Uh, but it, you want to be moving forward, taking control of your data, taking control of your process, and, and you want agreement, organizational agreement on that data that's coming over. It, it's very important. So, uh, if I've gotten all the blood out of that turnip. Um, number nine. So we're coming up on our last two questions. Number nine. Once the migration is completed, who is responsible for data quality? Now we asked about this question at the beginning of the, um, um, the event. It was one of our poll questions. And if you, if you recall, as the questions were coming in, as the responses were coming in, roughly 20% of, of you have a database manager or technology person or department that is responsible for data quality. 45% of you rely upon uh, place this response. And then it was 1% or 2% were relying on a consultant and the rest of you were not sure. So the answer, the right answer, is that they're all good answers. We, we can have someone from um, a tech team or a DBA. We can use marketing or communication uh, or fundraising or consulting. Any of them will work. They're all good choices. What's important here, and organizational structures are different, organizational sizes are different, are different. What's important here, though, is this, this, um, this, this, this item of what you've got to have accountability, budgeting, and, and time management or scheduling, or you're not going to succeed. Data quality is very different than, um, than just knowing how many records you have. Uh, preparing 50,000 records for an, uh, an email or a direct mail campaign, um, thinking about your communication channels, your multimedia communication channels, and how do you reach what segments of your marketplace, what are your trends, what is your historical giving. Data quality goes beyond that. And so there's a very simple, um, I, I guess I could have made this a ground rule. Yeah, I will next time. Um, there's a very simple rule of thumb here. If your data is not getting better, it's getting worse. I get folks objecting to this, what am I talking about? Why am I saying that? The data is in our system. You know, it, it's zeros and ones. It's all sitting in there and no, nobody's touching it. Nobody's changing it. Um, so it's got to at least be status quo, right? Well, no. Data degrades, and donor data degrades faster than any other type of data that a, uh, an organization or a company deals with. 
Donor data is very much, it, it, well, it's basically consumer data. Um, there are a lot of reasons why your data can be degrading. But trust me, this is going on. We're all on the webinar together. We're all, we're here. Um, your data is degrading even now. Why? Well, part, some of the reasons relate to your organization, your lack of data entry standards or unskilled data entry workers, maybe too many volunteers, maybe untrained people. There's basic common mistakes. There's any number of reasons that records can get fragmented. So all of your, your organization is acting on your data. Your technology is acting upon your data. You may have duplicate or disparate systems. You may have records stored in more than one place that are in conflict with each other. Your technology systems are going to go through upgrades. Upgrades do not just happen magically and do not always complete themselves 100% um, accurately. Uh, there may be inside your organization multiple systems that are integrated and processing and sharing data. And then, right, you live in the age of big data, right? There's just the sheer volume of data that is um, challenging us. And then there's cause number three, which is probably the single biggest reason why consumer or donor data degrades. It's us, right? We're, it, it's our lives. It's the fact that we change addresses, we change jobs. We have all sorts of family events. Um, we, we change our communication. And, and we put on anyone that's trying to keep up with us to stay in touch with us, to understand who we are. Uh, if, if, you're, if I'm in your donor database and you put me in there you know, five years ago and that record hasn't been worked on and, and updated and upgraded, uh, my life is different today than it was five years ago. If you don't know that about me, you may be losing me as a donor. Um, or you at least run the risk of losing me as a donor. So keep this in mind, your, donor, your data degrades, your donor data is degrading faster than any other data you've got in your system, faster than your accounting, uh, faster than your, your outcome measurement. Uh, your financial data, there's a lot of different data running around in your organization, but your donor data is, is kind of falling apart um, naturally. Uh, even, even if your organization is not negatively impacting it, even if your technology is, is spot on, at a bare minimum, you've got us as your problem, right? It, it, it's the fact that our lives change. So when it comes to maintaining that, big three is what really matters. Accountability, got to have somebody responsible, clear lines of responsibility for maintaining your data quality. Budget, if you don't have a budget in your organization for maintaining your data quality, um, you're going to be at a disadvantage. And then schedule. This is something that a, a, a challenge that I run into with lots of organizations. Uh, yeah, I know, the big three up top is no more, but it's, great. it's very referenceable, though, isn't it? I mean, it, some people look at uh, Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill, and they may or may not recognize everybody right away. Um, Chrysler is actually owned by a foreign company, but, you know, these are the big threes. I started to put up ABC, NBC, and CBS, but I figured, no, 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 no. It's not just that. Anyway, sorry. Um, thanks, Lauren. Um, the schedule. We don't understand, very often, we don't understand the importance of separating our data management schedule from our fundraising, our communication schedule. Uh, we may have three or four or ten different communication deadlines throughout the course of a year. And that may cause you from time to time to say, oh my gosh, you know, we, we had all of these returned envelopes or we've got all of these emails that are being uh, bounced and looks like they're turning into spam. What do you do? Uh, that data. Well, Go get the junior guy, uh, the new guy. I think he knows something about computers. Get him and have him take a look at it and see if he can clean up some of these old records or, or, or you know, look at these bad addresses. Um, somebody's got to, you know, go find somebody who can validate postal addresses for us. Uh, maybe we need to go append our data. You know, whatever the action is, the action is created reactively. The action to improve the quality of your data is being driven by something else. And that something else is a communication deadline, a fundraising deadline, or even worse, um, that came into the organization as a result of bad data. You've got to put your schedule. 
You've got to think about how frequently you want to update it, upgrade it, clean it, and keep it fresh and current so that the fundraising and the marketing team can go access it any time they want. And they're not waiting on somebody to reactively clean up a problem. Really, really important. Number 10, do we need a data consultant? Can we just rely on our new vendor to get that work done? Can we do it with an in-house resource? So this is kind of a self-serving part of the presentation, I know. Um, I believe you do need a data consultant. That's part of why I'm in this business. You may have in-house staffing that can do this work um, if they've got the time, and that's great. But you need somebody who can do more than just upload a file into a new CRM system. You've got to have um, trained resources that know how to extract the legacy data that's easier in some systems, more difficult in others. There's cleaning and normalization and purging that needs to occur. Uh, you have to actually create import files for the new CRM. Getting an extraction file out of your old system, that doesn't mean that that data is ready to go into the new. There's a lot of work that has to happen on that system. And then once, even once you've completed your migration, you still have archives and other issues that need to be addressed. So remember that technical process that I showed you earlier? Uh, and I was talking about how six steps really look more like 14 or 15. Well, in this case, um, I put up these big red circles to point out do you have a resource assigned to perform the task, those additional tasks. It's important to plan for your CRM vendor, uh, and I can't speak for all of them, but odds are that your CRM vendor wants to receive a clean data file. They want to say, import that clean file and get their work done as quickly as possible. If we go back, odds are your CRM vendor does not want to be cleaning and parsing, does not want to extract data out of that old Razor's Edge uh, or Access database or uh, GIF Pro or some of the others that can be really difficult to work with. Odds are they may not even want to create the import file. They want data brought to them so that they can run the import. And then once you're done with that data migration, um, that, CR, that vendor resource is not going to be there to help you do things like manage your archive files and make sure that you have everything um, buttoned up at the end of the process that you really need. So, Data migrations were plan. That's your ground rule reminder. Um, you really want to make sure that you know who is performing all of these tasks before you're done. So what's the outcome? What do we want? What's the desired outcome of, of making these decisions? You're going to run into them. What do we want to, uh, to get? What do we want to accomplish? Well, hopefully, we're, we're future focused and we're ready to go once, we're, once we have completed our data migration and our new CRM is up and running. Hopefully our data is clean. We are no longer wasting money. Um, many per record SAS systems, you know, if you're sitting there with an extra 10,000 data records that are, that are not really used or they're bad or haven't gotten around to cleaning them up, you're paying for it. No wasted time due to bad data clogging up systems. Uh, I can't tell you how many times we've talked to a client who says, yeah, our system has you know, 50,000 records, but what we really do is we run an export and then we trim out about 22,000 that we know are bad, and then we study it looking for bad fields, and then we cut those out, and then we have a file that we can work with uh, where we can go run our campaign. You're wasting a lot of time. At the end of the day, you want to improve your relationships and improve your fundraising results. And you got to remember, even with that brand new CRM, garbage in is garbage out. So, I hope we've hit some takeaways today and accomplished some things that we, that we set out to accomplish with you. Um, I want to make sure that everyone understands the CRM migration process. We want to make sure that we've identified those key issues along the way that you're going to run into so that you're prepared. We want, we want you to understand um, what your options are and how to make those tough decisions. It doesn't mean that everybody on the call is going to make all the same decisions tomorrow uh, as a result of this presentation, but hopefully you're all feeling better prepared to make those decisions and you have more control, a greater sense of control over that next data migration process. So how can we help? Uh, and Steve, this is where we're starting to wrap up here, right here at the end, but 
you know, this is what we do. Um, we run data basics like assessments and hygiene and management. We do the migrations and integrations and security work, uh, and we can handle some of the advanced tasks around warehousing and mining and, and, and detailed integration. So we're here to help. This is what we do. We're the geeks that enjoy this type of work. Um, and I, I really want to thank everyone here for attending. Your time is very much appreciated. I want to thank Bloomerang for hosting this event. It's great to be here on the Bloomerang channel and have an opportunity to chat about this. Steve, I think we've got some questions. I'm going to turn it over yeah. to you. And, and uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Gary. That's a lot of great information. And uh, thanks to everyone who is following along and chatting away with us and uh, sharing links. I always appreciate that. Uh, we've probably got about maybe three or four minutes for questions. Look like we've got one here from uh, Mary Lee. Uh, Gary, Mary Lee is wondering, in addition to moving data, should we also plan on moving processes? It seems like a, da a donor migration project is a good time to reevaluate all your processes in general, don't you think? Uh, I do. Um, I think that's a great question. I think it sort of ties into um, the data governance. Data governance will lead you to some process questions. I think uh, the next time I do this webinar, I'm actually going to bring that up because I think those are very much related. So yeah, take time in the planning steps of your data migration to ask those questions and see if you can get leadership on board to address changing some of those processes. Cool. And looks like uh, somebody was about to type, but uh, while we're waiting for some more questions, I just want to let everyone know that we do do these webinars once a week. We do them every Thursday. Um, we've got some cool webinars coming up. They're always free. They're always educational. Uh, one week from today, actually, we're going to be talking about um, silent auction items at your next fundraising event. We've got an expert on auctions who's going to be sharing some of her tips. So check that out. Check out our webinar page. There's there's lots of webinars scheduled through the fall. You can look at all the different topics and maybe find something that you're interested in there. Um, and do register for those. So Gary, it's, um, it looks like we're probably actually about out of time, and I want to give you time uh, at the end to talk about uh, how folks can get in touch with you. I know that um, maybe some people might have questions, and you said you'd be willing to answer them via email. So how can people get in touch with you? Sure. Uh, my email is on the screen there. It's gcar at nodesectorlabs.com. Um, please feel free to, to shoot me an email. If, if folks want to call me, uh, I can, you know, my phone number is 571-242-2313. Uh, I think yeah, dude, Go ahead. Do reach out. Um, Third Sector does really great work, and they've also got a great blog that you can uh, check out. And I think you guys have a newsletter too, so I would definitely uh, check out those things if you're interested in more uh, data tips uh, beyond. We do. It, in fact, I appreciate you mentioning that, Steve. We do run a, a pretty active blog. We also, if you follow us on Twitter, um, we'll, we'll pop interesting observations and, and sort of tips for the day. Things like that will come out over our Twitter account. And in our blogs and our Twitter accounts, one of the things that we're trying to do is to bring best practices, uh, make people aware of best practices from the commercial world that we think need to be part of data management best practices in the nonprofit world. So you will see us straddle that fence and talk about, hey, you know, this is what's happening in the commercial world. We need to think about doing this better or, or more or perhaps more differently in the, um, in the new, uh, in, in the nonprofit world. So I appreciate yeah, really you that up um, I, and, and helping me to plug those. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it is really good content, and Gary actually writes for our blog occasionally too. So if you check out the Bloomerang blog, you might see some articles from Gary uh, there as well. Well, it's about two o'clock. I wanna I wanna leave it there. I don't want to keep anyone any longer, especially if you haven't eaten lunch. Uh, so Gary, thanks so much for being here for about an hour or so and sharing all your knowledge. I I appreciate it, Steve. Will we be sending out the presentation to everybody? Yeah, I'm going to send out the recording and the slides here in just probably about an hour or so. That's usually about how long it takes to upload to YouTube. So everyone look for your, an email from me uh, later on this afternoon. We'll share all this good information with you. And uh, do check out our upcoming webinars. We hope to see you next week uh, or sometime soon. So have a great rest of your day and a good weekend if we don't talk to you. Bye now.